wash away my sin, nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Amen. Sing it out now. Nothing but the blood of Jesus for my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Amen. Sing it out. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other foul I know. Nothing but the blood of Amen. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. <coughs> Amen. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. the blood of this is all my righteousness <clears throat> nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other foul I know nothing but the blood of Jesus if you're thankful for the blood of Jesus this morning, say amen. amen. Now hymn number 50. Hymn number 50, we're going to sing, There's power in the blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood on that verse now. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil the victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the comfort cleansing. For a cleansing to Calvary's tide, there's wonderful power in the blood. Sing it out now. Lift it up. <coughs> Amen. Power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood, sin stains are lost in its life giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood, amen. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood. Sing it on that last now. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood. Would you live daily? Would you live daily? His praises to sing. There's wonderful power in the blood. Sing it out now. Power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Do you believe that this, this morning? <laughs> All right. Amen. Good evening. I hope you still believe it this evening. You can be seated. Good seat.
Well, good morning, right, Ben? Good morning, Calvary Baptist Church. It's good to see you all this morning. It's good to see all the visitors. If you were handed a visitor's card, if you don't mind filling that out and dropping that in the offering plate as that comes by here in a moment, we'd much appreciate it. We have a few announcements here. Don't forget about our soul winning has been moved from Saturdays to Tuesdays at 6 o'clock. Also, you want to come back tonight for this evening, right? Not this morning, but for this evening, we have the special music. We have the Assurance Trio. Yes, it's the Assurance Trio. Uh, from Heartland Baptist College will be coming to sing tonight. Um, so uh, come for that. And then also Wednesday, on Wednesday, uh, right after church on Wednesday, if you're uh, wanting to help with the yard team, mowing and stuff, we will be meeting after church then to set up our teams. Also, ladies, another retreat, another ladies retreat coming up this Friday. This Friday, y'all will be leaving at 7 a.m. here from the church, 7 a.m. headed to St. Jo Joseph, Missouri. Don't forget about that. Then also men, finally, our turn. Men's and boys camp out coming up May 2nd through the 4th. Uh, and then also we have camp coming up, summer's upon us. Senior camp is June 10th through the 14th. There will be a sign-up sheet uh, out there probably this evening. And then also junior camp is the same week, June 10th through the 14th. But listen to this, for the junior camp, that is 3rd through 8th graders. $25 deposit is due this Wednesday for the junior camp only. June 10th through the 14th, that's 3rd through 8th graders, $25 deposit due this Wednesday. That is all the announcements that we have. We'll go ahead and have the ushers come forth at this time, and we'll take up tithes and offering. And like I said before, if you were, had a visitor's card, if you don't mind dropping that in the offering plate, we'd much appreciate that. And we'll go ahead and pray for the offering now. Lord, we thank you so much. For this beautiful day that you've given us, Lord, thank you for allowing us to be in your house, Father. I pray that you'd be a pastor in the message that you've given him, Lord. I pray that you would just allow him to preach it with liberty, Father. And us, the congregation, give us ears to hear, Father, and not just let your word go by us, Lord. Just a checkbox off the week of I went to church, but truly get into your word. Allow us to edify ourselves through that. Lord, I pray also as we take up the tithes and offering that you bless the gift and the giver. In your name we pray. Amen. Hymn number 90, number 90, on that first verse. Now, more love to thee, O Christ, more love to thee. Let this be your prayer this morning. More love to thee, O Christ, more love to thee. Hear thou the prayer I make on bended knee. This is my earnest plea. Once 
earthly joy I craved. Once earthly joy I craved, sought peace and rest. Now the alone I seek, give what is best. This song my prayer shall be, more love of Christ to thee. That was your prayer this morning. Say amen. amen. Good singing. You can be seated. the Father from before the world began. Every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand. All creation holds together by the power of your voice. Let the skies declare your glory let the land and seas rejoice you're the author of creation you're the lord of every man and your cry of love rings out across the lands yet you left the gaze of angels came to seek and save the lost and exchange the joy of heaven for the anguish of a cross. With a prayer you fed the hungry, with a word you stilled the sea, yet how silently you suffered that the guilty may go free. You're the author of creation, you're the Lord of every man, and your cry of love rings out across the land. With a shout you rose victorious, wrestling victory from the grave, and ascended into heaven, leading captives in your wake. Now you stand before the Father, interceding for your own. From each tribe and tongue and nation, you are leading sinners home. You're the author of creation, you're the Lord of every man, and your cry of love rings out across the land. You're the author of creation, you're the Lord of every man, and your cry of love rings out across the land. Amen. 
Great job, fellas. I'd like to ask you to take your Bibles and go with me to 1 John chapter number 2. 1 John chapter number 2. If you are here as a guest with us, great to have you here. We've got several of you here today. It's also great to have my sister up from Fort Worth, Texas. Yeah, but you live in Fort Worth, right? Okay. All right. Fort Worth, Texas. Good to have her here. And did you get a good view of the eclipse? Yes, in the background. You don't have to if you live there. Yeah, you're in the you're in the path of it. First John chapter number two, and then um, great to see Meredith's dad. I'm excited to say hi to you afterward. All right, uh, glad to see you here with us as well. And uh, if you're in First John chapter number two, <clears throat> uh, we are going to begin reading in verse number 15 and then read down through verse number 17. So if you'll stand with me for the reading of God's word. First John chapter two, verse 15 down through verse 17. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, The love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Thank you for staying for the reading of God's word. You can be seated. I want you to notice, uh, first, let me just say, this is an incredible passage of Scripture. It's an incredible passage of Scripture. I I will not be primarily focusing on verse 15 and 16 this this morning. I'm going to put my attention to that this evening, and I'm going to really focus on verse number 17, where the Bible says, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. This is an incredible verse of Scripture. This is also a verse of Scripture that would be incredibly easy to misunderstand. And I want to share share with you some wonderful truth from here. Uh, But this primary thought this morning is this, And the world passeth away. What in the world does that mean? And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I'm going to do a brief study with you here on uh, what that verse means and what that phrase means. The more I looked into this, the more really incredible it was. And so I hope it'll be a help to you. Let's pray, ask God's help, and we'll get right into the message. Lord, we thank you again for the day. We thank you for the chance to be here, and God, thank you for the wonderful truth that even though the world passes away and the lust thereof, that if we would do your will, and specifically your will, will abide forever. So help us, I pray, to live and to be able to live in a land where there is no night, an eternal land of heaven, God, I pray that you would let no one leave here today and go from this place to the eternal place of hell. And God, I pray you'd help us as we look here in your word today to see the importance of of not just of living in this world, but using our time in this world to make a difference for all of eternity. We ask you to help us now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 15, a really simple command, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, because the Bible says if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, I'll go back to that here tonight, and we'll focus on that some more. Uh, This verse does not say, for example, in verse 15, that if you like living in the world, you're not saved. That's not what the verse is saying. Uh, But the Bible is giving to us, as God's children, this is written to those who are saved, it's giving to us the the way that we have to live if we are going to make a difference in this world and be able to make a difference 
for all of eternity. Now, it's going to describe what's in the world because the world can be a reference to, to many things. The world can just be a reference to the planet, right? We live in the world. Hopefully, you're all here in the world today, all right? Hopefully, you're not somewhere else this morning. It can just be a reference to the planet, but oftentimes, the world is making a reference to the system of this world that is governed by Satan and that is driven by sinful desires. And so uh, the Bible expands on what it's talking about in verse 16 when it says, for all that is in the world, and then it gives three distinctions, and all sin can be broken down into one of these three or parts of these three. So, for example, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So the Bible says that what makes up the world are the lusts or the desires of our flesh. The lust of the flesh, the desires that we have of our flesh, just simply means sinful desires. Your flesh is a reference to your sinful nature. All right, do we have sin nature? Yes, all right? Uh, has anyone ever sat their child down and said, now I need to teach you how to be disobedient? Nope, hasn't happened yet. No one's, it hasn't happened yet. No, no one has had to tell their children, look, I just wish you would eat junk food. I wish you would just eat junk food like a normal kid, all right? Uh, it's, it's normal for us to do the things that we want and what our desires are naturally are very selfish and they are sinful, all right? So there is the lust of the flesh. There is the lust of the eyes. There are those things that are appealing to what we see. So there are some things that we desire internally, others that are externally desirable, and then the pride of life. You can go back, by the way, and you can look even at the very first sin in the Garden of Eden, and you'll be able to see that it appealed to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And if you'd stop to look at whatever you're battling with, it's probably going to be one or both of those three categories. And the Bible tells us all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, in verse number 17, it says, and the world passes away. All right, now that's strange. Because as long as sin has been on this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's still going strong, right? We pass away, and that's a phrase that we'll use. It's a phrase that, that the Bible uses for those who are saved when they die. Uh, we would pass away, but it's strange that the Bible says that the world passes away and the lust thereof. Now, this means a couple things. And I'll tell you right offhand, the, the, the main thing that's being drawn for us here is the temporary nature of what sin offers. It's temporary. Versus what God gives to us that is eternal. So the advantage you get out of living in the world, which is going to be living for yourself, living with sinful desires, those things that appeal to your eyes, to your flesh, and to your pride you get the benefit of them immediately, but it doesn't last. Where if you'll live for the Lord and you'll do His will, the benefits of that go on forever and ever. The Bible says the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now listen, the world, as even as we look at it, it's temporary. It's temporary. I love when... People who are, who are, you know, evolutionists say, you know, the world was here before we were, and it'll be here long after we're gone, as if the rock that floats in earth, that floats in space, is some, has some kind of a brain of its own. All right? The truth is that our earth is temporary. There is going to come a day when God is actually going to destroy it, and he's going to make a new one. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth, and uh, our earth is temporary, but as far as how we live, our lives are very temporary. 
we only get so much time on this planet. And that number is different for all of us. Average life expectancy can be, I think, 78 or so, getting close to 80. The Bible says that, that if you get 70 to 80 years, you've pretty much had a full life. And thank God when you get more. Amen. Amen, right, Miss Martha? Amen? Are you glad to have more? She's still thinking about it. Um, and, and we're in no rush, right? We're not like, all right, you're 80, you're done. We all said amen, all right? But, uh, but that's basically a, the average lifespan or so. And the Bible says that, that our days are but a vapor. It appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You think about it. Our time is short. Uh, the usefulness of our own bodies is short. Sometimes you live, but your body can't keep up, and your mind and your heart still go, but your body isn't uh, what it once was, and it's, uh, it's just the nature of life. But even if you live longer, your, your years of activity are usually less than the amount of time that you live. It's just the nature of it. As you get older, you're able to do less. What's happening? Well, slowly but surely, we're passing away, slowly but surely. And um, I remember Brother Martins was preaching one time, and he said that he used to, during prayer requests, he used to wonder why the older people prayed for all of their aches and pains all the time. And if I remember correctly, he said, and now I'm praying for my aches and pains. It's just the nature of life. You can't... Uh, Every guy has a point in time he usually finds out by playing basketball in, in America. He plays basketball, and after he plays basketball, he can't get out of bed the next day. All right, he was an all-star that night, but now he is an invalid for a week. And, uh, and, and he figures out, I'm not as young as I once was. Now, I don't know how it works for ladies. I've never really asked them. Maybe they have the good sense to just know that. All right, I don't know. But, but at some point... You, you realize, I'm getting older. I can't, I'm not as strong as I once was. I can't think as quickly as I used to. I can't go as long as I used to. Maybe you need to sleep more. Whatever the case is, little by little, uh, we just get reminded that our bodies are temporary. Our time on earth is temporary. And, uh, and our, our time on earth is only so short. Now, I bring all that up because the Bible says, the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, it's pretty clear that what is here in front of us in the world, as the Bible defines it, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of the life, it's temporary. It's not going to be here forever. The world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. So the option is, you've got something that's temporary, or you've got something that's eternal. And God says, and God makes it clear, his interest is in things that last forever. Did you know that though our bodies are temporary, you have a never dying soul? Amen. That after your time on earth is done, your soul will go to one of two places, and those places are eternal. It'll either go to an eternal heaven or it'll go to an eternal hell. The Bible tells us in Revelation 14, 11, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. Hell is, is a life sentence that never ends because you have an eternal soul. It is a time of suffering that lasts forever because you have a never dying soul. I'll show you here in just a moment, but heaven is also an eternal place too. Thank God for that. I, I'm so thankful for that. But you have an eternal soul, and your eternal soul goes to one of two places. The Bible tells us the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that do, does the will of God abides forever. So I got interested. What does this mean, the world passes away? Because I know that I assume it means that the time will come where the world's systems get done away with, and the time will come where our sinful nature gets done away with. What does that mean? So as I looked 
passes away, uh, what does it mean? It just means to, to go near, um, but keep on going, to pass away. So I looked to see when else this word is used in the Bible. Now, it's a Greek word, and I didn't write down the Greek word. Because I don't speak Greek, and no one here does. All right? But if you really want to know, I could probably tell you afterward what it was. But I just looked at the ways the word was used in the Bible, and I was shocked to find that the word pass away, that the word that's translated here, is used, and it is not just used in reference to uh, to eternity or to when somebody passes away. But I was surprised to find, uh, let me just go with me to a few places. Go with me here to Matthew chapter 9, and I'll show you the word as it's used in the Bible. So Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 9. I think the word's used around 27 times in the Bible, and we're going to look at a few of them here. Matthew 9, verse number 9. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. All right, so when the Bible says, And as Jesus passed forth, same word we use, passed forth, same word, as the world passes away. So in Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 9, Jesus, the Bible says, sees Matthew. Matthew's going to become one of Jesus' disciples. In fact, he becomes one of the 12 disciples in this verse. And the Bible says that here's Matthew. You're doing taxes. It's tax time, so do some taxes. All right? He's doing taxes. Matthias is getting the bad news. He's getting here. He's doing his taxes. And the Bible says that Jesus comes near him, and he says to him, follow me. And then he keeps on going, and he passed forth. And then he's going to get up. He's not going to get his taxes finished, and he's going to follow him. And from this point on, then Matthew sticks with the Lord Jesus and becomes one of that become what we call the 12 disciples. All right? Great job. Thanks. Then go with me to Matthew chapter 9, same chapter. Look at verse number 27. Matthew 9, verse number 27. The Bible says... When Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying, saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. The same word that we use for pass away is now being translated when Jesus departed thence. Two blind men followed him, crying, saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. So we've got two blind people that are here, and they know that Jesus can heal them. And as Jesus is near them and starting to go away, they see that. He's about to pass by them, and they start crying out, have mercy on us, have mercy on us. And, and they cry out and make a huge fuss, and we won't go into all the verse about it, uh, but they get Jesus' attention. You get the idea. Go to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. <coughs> Same verse. <coughs> Same verse we read before. Uh, just now in, in Mark. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, which is Matthew, another name for him, sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said, follow me. And he arose and followed him. Same phrase, passed by, we would use to say passed away. All right, go to Mark chapter 15 and verse number 21. Mark chapter 15 and verse number 21. And they compel one, Simon, a Cyrenian, who, everybody say it, passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Now, we could look at some of the other verses, but all of them bear out the same thing. It just means this, that at some point they were close, and this is the key, it's actually the word that's used to say when something is closest, but is then on the path that it's on going to become further and further away. Does that make sense? All right, so, so here we go. I'm walking by, and right now I'm passing by. That's the closest I'm going to get, 
and now I'm getting further and further away. Right? And, uh, and so that word, whenever it's used in the Bible, it's a reference to whenever something is closest, but on the path that it's on, it'll get further and further away if nothing changes. Does that make sense? I got to thinking about the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God, why would that same phrase as it's used for somebody who's passing by be given as a reference to, to us when it comes to the world and the world passes away and the lust thereof? And I realize that, that if Jesus does not come back in my lifetime and I get buried and I die and that's the end of my life, they put me in the ground the world system will still go on, right? It'll still go on. The lust thereof, it still goes on. The battle for sin rages long after you and I are gone, if the Lord Jesus hasn't returned. Now, when the millennium happens, it's a different time. That's not the purpose of the message, all right? Um, But for how we live, our time on this world is just like what the Bible says, the world passes away and the lust thereof. In other words, wherever you are right now, if you think about this, you have one less day on earth today than you did yesterday. Your time on earth is getting further and further away. Now, I'm not trying to depress anybody here, okay? <laughs> this is not my purpose, is to say we're all slowly dying And every moment you spend in church is one. I'm not saying that, all right? All all I'm trying to say is that, that your time on earth, it is limited. And the amount of time you have, I I was originally thinking, you know, when somebody hits 40, they're over the hill because, you know, you've lived probably half your life at this point. But the truth is that for all of us right now, the world's passing away. It, our time on earth is less and less and less. And even if you're a teenager, and hopefully you've got a long time in front of you, that's what all of us want. Or even if you're a little girl who's, how old is she? Three. So hopefully she's, she's just getting started, right? She's, probably, she's not even going to remember today, probably, unless, unless she gets some kind of massive piece of cotton candy. And probably then still not going to, all right? All right, but for all of us, the world is, I love this analogy and this word, the way it's used, it's as close now as it'll ever be, and it's only going to get further and further away. The world passes away. Jesus passed by. Here's Simon, the Bible says, and he was passing by, and, and had things stayed the way they were, then in that moment they were close but then they would have gotten further and further away. But what's so incredible is that in every time this phrase is used in the Bible, though, though in that moment, here we are, he, he comes by Matthew and he says, follow me, and now he's passing by, right? He doesn't stop and say, and I need you to quit your tax business and follow me. Come on, what, what do I have to offer you? He gives him the call, follow me, and he keeps on going. But in that moment, while he's getting further away, if he stays here and sits then he gets further away. But if he acts in this moment, it doesn't have to stay that way. When something is passing away or passing by, you've got an opportunity to act. If you don't do anything, then it gets further and further away. And the world passes away and the lust thereof. Our time that we have here gets less and less, but just the same way as a person passes by, you do have an opportunity to do something about it while it's near. And that's why the rest of the verse says, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. So if you take this temporary time that we have on earth that is passing away and you act on it, then you can have something that is eternal that is brought forth out of something that is temporary. Now, remember, God's interested in the eternal. And the Bible says, he that does the will of God abides forever. So what is 
the will of God? Well, that's a big question for sure, right? There are a number of things that are the will of God, but the Bible says he that doeth the will of God abides forever. So go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Remember, if you were in 1 John for our text, you'll just be a couple pages backward. 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter two. Oh, hold on. Did I write the wrong reference down? Brother Martins. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness. But his long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Where is it? Where's the reference? 3.9. I wrote 2 down. 1 Peter chapter 3. No, it's not 1 Peter 3.9. 2 Peter? What? It's not Matthew. I know it's, I know it's Peter. <laughs> 2 Peter 3 9? 2 Peter 3 9. This was a test. This was a test. And many of you did not pass, including the one who gave the test, all right? In 2 Peter 3 9, let's go there. The Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should what? Perish but that all should come to repentance. Look, your time on earth is temporary. It's passing by. But while it's passing by, if you will do what God wants you to do, it will abide forever. Well, what is the will of God? Here it is. It is God's will for everybody to be saved. Did you know there is no one who has ever been born that God did not want to be saved? There is no person that God looked at and said, oh, oh, that's a terrible, terrible person. I'm not going to save that person. No, the Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The, in fact, the, the man who wrote this book, Peter, Peter was a person who got so ashamed of Jesus that he denied he even knew him, and he filled his denial full of profanity. Over and over, vehemently swore, I know not the man. Finally said, okay, maybe we got you confused. I guess Jesus' disciples don't talk like that. That was him. Paul, the man who wrote the majority of the New Testament, the Bible says we first meet him when he was consenting to the death of Stephen. He gathered people together. He said, that man's a heretic. He should be killed. I'll hold your coats. He had, he had letters that he had uh, gained permission to go and imprison people for their, for their faith, and God wanted to save him. I, I remind you that if you look through the pages of the, of the Word of God, that you have got much of it who has been penned by murderers and adulterers. There is nobody whom God doesn't want to save. There is no country whom God does not care about. There are no people whom Jesus did not die on the cross for. There is no sin too great that the blood of Jesus Christ cannot cleanse you here. And if you're here this morning and you think, well, I want to be saved, but before I get saved, I really got to clean up my life then I want you to know that Jesus Christ wants you just as you are. And the only way that you're going to get victory over sin is through the power of His blood. And the only way you'll really have victory, you don't clean yourself up to go to God. You go to God, and He helps clean you up. And there we have a God who the Bible says, if you'll do His will, you'll abide forever. What's the will of God? Well, I found it in First Peter or Second Peter chapter 3. We eventually found it. No thanks to some ridiculous. At least I knew it wasn't Matthew. Uh, that, that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And if you're here today and you have never repented, repentance is a change of mind that produces a change of life. It, repentance is change that begins internally. Now it always manifests 
externally, but it begins internally. The Bible says that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What do we repent about? We change our mind that we cannot save ourselves, that no amount of good works could ever wash away my sin, but only Jesus' blood can forgive me of my sin. I remind you this, your opportunity to be saved is passing by. If you do nothing, it'll get further and further away. It'll get more and more difficult for you if you wait. But if you act on this moment, then you could claim Jesus Christ. You could run to the cross and you could embrace him as your Savior and you could be saved today. And it is God's will for you to be saved. Because I really want to know what God wants for me. Here's number one. He wants you to be saved. I want you to say, God's will is for me to be saved. Everyone say it. God's will is for me to be saved. Now, I'm going to pause, and I want you in your mind to say your name. Let's do this again. God's will is for to be saved. I didn't know if you were going to say it in your mind or say it out loud, but I couldn't even get everybody to say the first part with me. God wants you to be saved. Listen, it is the will of God for you to be saved. It's His will. God sends conviction in your heart to let you know that He wants you to be saved. And if you are not careful, you can quench the Holy Spirit and you can say no to the Lord and it makes it harder for you to say yes to Him. It is the will of God for you to be saved. He tells us in 1 John chapter number 2, don't love the world or the things that's in the world. It's temporary. It's passing away. The best this world offers, the best is temporary. It's temporary. Money, fame, acclaim, accomplishments, all those things benefit you nothing when your time on earth is done. The world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abides forever. Listen, God is interested in the eternal. You have an eternal soul. It is God's will for you to be saved. I remind you this. Let's see if I can uh, get it right this time. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 4. This one's right. Hang on, I didn't write this down so I don't do that again. Okay. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse number 4. Peter is writing, and the Bible says in verse 4, to, he's writing to God's people, I'll read verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again, born, we've been born again, unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So because we have received Christ and because he lives, we have a lively hope. Verse number 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, this inheritance that God has promised for us, the Bible says it cannot corrode and it cannot be defiled. And the Bible says that it does not fade away. It is reserved in heaven for you. Listen, not only is God's will for you to be saved, but if you will follow the Lord, the rewards you have waiting are also eternal. The rewards you have waiting are eternal. I've got some trophies packed away somewhere. At some point, guys have to figure out what to do with all their trophies, especially if you're like me and you won a lot of things. <laughs> I'm kidding. I didn't win a lot of things. But uh, I, I did well in spelling bees and chess tournaments. All right? And, um, and so those are my trophies. Everything else was, was not trophies. And um, so I've got these trophies. And I remember, I remember being in these tournaments and... Uh, and I, I remember one particularly. Um, that I would they were they were tournaments for for school aged kids. So you had to be in high school to be in them or, or or in school. You couldn't be college or above. And um, and I remember in one tournament I had gone and won my first three games and I was playing on table one against the strongest rated player. This is her name was Julia Kozuk. There's an H at the end. She was Russian. So. America versus Russia. It's like Rocky Four, you know. 
And, uh, and she kind of looked, no, okay, she didn't. Uh, but um, now she had a brother. Her brother kind of did. But, but anyway, um, and so I remember I was playing on table one, and I, I remember I had been thinking, and I had this problem that uh, when, when you think hard enough for a long time, you can get a headache. You can, you can exhaust. You, you, your brain just gets tired. And I had this bad headache, and I had taken some medication, and I was playing on table one against Julia Kozuk, and, uh, and she, was, uh, she was very, very good. She defeated a bunch of people, and I remember thinking, this is it. This is it. And so I played to the end game, and I had a one end game. And I won't bore you with chess things, but it was a one end game. I was going to promote a pawn to a queen, and I was going to win. And, and I was going to promote first, and I had to win. And I was so excited. I was thinking, first place, here we go. Go Team USA. Right? I mean, the president didn't know about this match, but he might want to call me afterward to congratulate me. Because, you know, it was a big deal. And so, and so anyways, I was so excited. I had the game won handily. And so I uh, promoted my pawn. And the moment I promoted my pawn, the moment I said, queen, the moment I did it, and I hit my clock, she said, draw, stalemate. And chess, a stalemate happens when the king has no legal moves, but he's not in check. And it's, it's a draw. And, and so... You can have a one game, and you can draw it, basically. You can blow it, and that's what I did. So I ended up tying, and, you know, they had to split, and I somehow, because of tie breaks, I was somehow in second. I don't know how that worked. I don't know how that works, but somehow she got, and I remember I got this trophy, and I was, I was, I was pretty excited about it. You know, I was playing for it. I really wanted to win. There might have even been, like, $25 for first place. I think, I think the entry fee was 30 but um, there's a racket, if there was ever a racket. People don't, eh, the IRS overlooks all those chess sharks. But, uh, but anyway, um, it was a big deal. And now I look back on it and I just laugh. You know, it was a chess tournament. It wasn't a big deal. In the moment, it seemed like a really big deal. In the moment, I thought, oh, I, I, I can't believe. I was so disappointed, too, because I had defeated her brother. And, and they were both Russians. I mean, they're, they're very good at chess, right? They, they play from a young age. It's a big deal there. It's not like in America. My wife is tuning out right now. <laughs> My own wife. The look on her face. We got it. We got it. The point is the world passes away and the lust thereof. The things that seem really important to you right now will later you'll look back on and realize they're not that important. They're not that important. I, I've talked with guys who... I know some guys who have been tremendously successful hunters, and they have shot tons of large deer, uh, large bucks, and, I mean, beautiful mounts. And, and I look at the things they've shot, and, uh, and they complain, oh, I didn't have a good season. Oh, this, this was embarrassing. And they're casually still shooting things better than I've ever shot. And all of them to a person have got to the point where they have actually said, yeah, it's just another big deer. At one point, it was life. It was the reason to get up at 2.30 in the morning and drive an hour, army crawl through the dirt, not shower for three days. That way the deer somehow won't be able to smell your scent. That's the thought. I'm not getting into it right now. All right? You know, they're putting mud on their face. They're doing all that because that, the, nothing was more important in that moment. But then the time came, and they realized it's not that important. It's not. The world passes away in the lust thereof. You have a chance on earth to live for things that will never lose their value. You have a chance on earth to live for things that will live forever. If you're here today and you know Christ as your Savior, can I remind you the world passes away, but what you do during this time you have can affect eternity. It's the will of God for you to be saved, and the rewards that God has for his children are eternal. Live for things that will outlive you. Would you bow your heads with me for prayer? I'd like to just ask a few questions for you. 
The first question is this. Shh, I need everybody quiet, all right? The first question is this. How many of you would say, I know that I'm saved? I know if I died today, I know I'm on my way to heaven. Could you hold your hand up? You say, that's me. I do know I'm saved. That's great. I see lots of hands up. That's good. You can put them down. Not everybody is saved. Not everybody could say that. How many of you say this? I'd like to be saved. I'd like to be saved. When I die, I'd like to know my sins are forgiven. That's me. Could you hold your hand up? Good. Good. Who else? Good. Who else? You say, I need to be saved this morning. God spoke into my heart. I need to be saved. It is the will of God for you to be saved. If you're here today and you're not saved, I have great news for you. You don't have to stay unsaved. Jesus died on the cross for you. He paid the price for your sins so that you could be saved. If you want to be saved, here's what I ask you to do. Would you just look up at me right now? You say, I'd like to be saved. We've got people in the back who would take a Bible and show you how you could know for sure. All you have to do, we've got a man for men and a lady for ladies. All you have to do is just go stand up right now and they'll take you there into the fellowship hall and open God's word and you could be saved. Why don't you do that right now? You say, that's me. I need to be saved. Just go to them. They'd love to open the pages of God's word and show you how you could be saved. You just make your way back to them right now. That's right. It is God's will for all people to be saved and you don't have to stay unsaved. You say, that's me. I need to be saved. All you have to do is make your way to the back. Mrs. Martins has a Bible in her hand. She'll open it and show you how you could be saved. Here's the next question. How many of you would say this? I know Christ is my Savior, but with God's help, I want to live for things that are eternal. And God spoke to me about it this morning. That's me. Could you hold your hand up? I see many hands up. That's great. Good. You can put them down. In just a moment, the invitation song is going to play. If God spoke into your heart, the altars are open here at the front. It's a chance for you to be saved, if you're, a chance for you uh, to do business with God. If you're here today and you need to be saved, we'd love to show you how you can be. Just make your way to the back, and we'll open God's Word and show you how you can receive Christ. If you're here and you say, I want to live for things that are eternal. He that doeth the will of God abides forever. Following God leads to things that last forever. The invitation will be open for you. You come if God's spoken to your heart. Would you stand? Help us, Lord, I pray. Would you bless the invitation? In Jesus' name, amen.